Welcome to Wellness Radio with Dr. Jeanette Gallagher as your host. Her show discusses topics of health, wellness, and spirituality and is about discovering your place in this great universe from your cells to the cosmos. Along with her guest in casual conversation, she strives to ask the difficult questions that may be holding you back from a vibrant life and shares new ideas that may inspire you to make a change in your life that you only can see in your dreams. And now, here is Dr. Jeanette Gallagher. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Wellness Radio. This is Dr. Jeanette Gallagher, and it's a pleasure to have you with us here this evening. Tonight, we are going to be talking about the tools, the tips, the inspiration, and the path to walk to be able to find our soul, our spirit, and improve our human quality of life in the process. It's this big web we are in, so to speak. No longer is it the idea that we have this body and we go out and we just farm it off to a doctor to fix it. Or we go to the church and the priest is going to fix our soul. We go to a mental health and they work on our mind. It's really about being able to say, what am I made of? Who am I? Soul and spirit. This human vehicle, this body that is carrying around and housed me to have this experience in life, but also, too, what is the grand story all about? What is my life all about? And can we see that it is evolving at warp speed and enjoy the ride? So many things are changing these days. Health, wellness, finances, mind, heart, soul, politics, religion, everything seems to be coming at us. And we're feeling like we're, it's almost like you're in one of those rubber ball places and they just keep shooting the wiffle ball at you. And you feel it every day. You feel it in your heart. You feel it in your mind. You feel it in your body. What do you do? How do you navigate your days? And how do you work through the process to say, that's not going to be my story that defines me. It's going to be an experience in which I pass through. Today, my guest is Dr. Jan Patterson. She is the co-author of Breath for the Soul, Self-Care Steps to Wellness, Integrative Wellness, Use Breath, Movement, Nutrition, Spirit, and Mindfulness for Stress, Anxiety, Depression, and Grief. Dr. Patterson, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Jeanette. It's great to be here. So glad to have you, Dr. Patterson, because we uh, look at the these days and we say there's so many changes in the world and people are coming in they're saying i'm feeling like i'm being bombarded and they feel it in their body and we we try to help them with their body but then we turn around and say it's got to be more to the story don't you think that's what your book is about there's more to the story yes absolutely and stress is all around us these days uh, you know, millions of years ago, our body adapted to uh, stress when a predator was chasing us and we had the fight-or-flight response. But today, the stresses are things like traffic, phone calls, our work, you know, our family, uh, all the duties that we have to do. And so one of the things that we talk about in the book is how to calm down and how to change our response from the stress response to the relaxation response so that we can think more clearly, act more rationally, treat people more kindly. Right, because what it really is is that we're going out as feeling people. You know, if you look back on decades and decades ago, in 50s and 60s, we would go outside and we would feel good and we wouldn't have all of these influences on us. Now we go outside and we feel like it's just coming at us from everywhere. But we're still the same person. You know, I'm almost 70 myself, and we're still the same person, but we're going, what's going on? And how do we deal with it, and how do we navigate with it? Because so many people are saying, I just can't get it. But then there's mm-hmm. another group of the population that says, I don't feel it. I don't notice it. Because they didn't have that experience of the calmness that we had mm-hmm. before. So we're kind of like looping back. How can we bring ourselves back to... That space and time where life was easier, things were cleaned out, 
a lot of toxins weren't around in our homes. We weren't uh, mm-hmm. pouring all of these drugs into us. We weren't um, feeling like everybody was pushing and pulling at us to have this success. That's. I think we're looping back to that sense of that time and yeah. phase in life. Yes. I agree, Dr. Jeanette. And, you know, our our life is so fast-paced these days. Uh, it's it's really become an expectation that we multitask, even though uh, yeah. there's data that shows that multitasking is not efficient. So one of the things that we talk about in the book is is using our breath, uh, check in with our breathing, you know, breathe more slowly, deeply, regularly, uh, use abdominal breathing, um, and, you know, follow our breath during the day just to slow down. And we have some specific breathing exercises in the book that are helpful. And and as we follow our breath, we can become more mindful. Instead of, you know, thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow or worrying about what's going to happen later today or ruminating about what happened yesterday, just to think about the present, you know, where we are right now. And uh, checking in with our breath and taking some slow, deep breaths can help us do that. Yeah, because I think when we really come down to it, we always think about these outside things, what we look like, how we're functioning and everything. And we think that is the me, and it has to be perfect, and it has to be right, and it has to be healthy and all. But in essence, the breath is the only thing that's keeping us here. The breath is mm-hmm. the only thing in the heart that's keeping us, you know, on this planet. So if we can mm-hmm. come back to that as the source of our soul and our spirit – and define that connection as truly this is all we really need in the moment in time, some of the mm-hmm. outside noise will start to dissipate, don't you think? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, and people have found that uh, just taking slow, deep breaths can be very calming uh, and help you focus on the here and now. We also have also recommend some other things like movement, um, you know, we found that using movement throughout the day, whether it's moderate or vigorous, or whether it's even just getting in the outdoors and taking a slow walk outdoors and noticing, you know, the sounds, the smells, the sights around you, that that can be very reinvigorating too and, and also very calming. So, um, you know, and, and as you mentioned, the breath, you know, our breath is involuntary. We do it without thinking. But... Uh, It's also voluntary. We have control over it, and we can intentionally control our breathing. And that's really one of the things that we can do to check in with ourselves and calm ourselves down. Let's talk about the words stress, anxiety, depression, and grief. Are Mm -hmm. they not um, a time in life in which you have a checkoff and you say, well, you must be here because you meet these qualifications, and therefore you take on that identity and then that identity ends up being who you believe you are. And you're kind of stuck with that, you know, and it ends up being this perception that you start to collect. I'm depressed, so I must have this. I have mm-hmm. anxiety, so I must have that. And it mm-hmm. it almost seems to be a cloak that you wear. Are we not really looking for a sense of how can we let go of all of these perceptions and all of these identities and see my way through, because only then can you truly dance in the world. I mean, sometimes when you have Mm -hmm. stuff so weighted down, you really are kind of melted into one place to be able to figure it out, do you think? Oh, I agree. And, you know, while a certain amount of stress can be good, you know, for instance, if we're going to do a task or give a presentation, you know, a little stress can be very helpful to us to focus and do our best job. But the problem is when we have a lot of stress, and particularly over a long period of time, and that can lead to anxiety, uh, that can lead to depression. And, of course, you know, we all experience grief at one time or another in our lives. And so um, really using the, the different pillars of breath, movement, nutrition, and spirit, you know, getting in touch with our spirit, our spirituality, you know, whether that's your faith or nature or the arts, but getting in touch with that and realizing that there's a connection with other people and a higher being, you know, that can really help us in terms of getting back to ourselves, back to our soul, and, you know, realizing what we really are. When we talk about eating, you talk about stress eating, and, um, you know, we, it's really about nourishing, you know, the body in one way. And 
I'll never forget, I had this patient, and we were talking about things, and I'd given her a list. It was like a whole bunch of stuff, all different parameters around the web of, you know, of our existence. It would be something like massage or maybe homeopathy or going outside or uh, sleeping or maybe something she w- had in her home or different things like that. She said, this looks like a job. I already have a job. I can't do this. <laughs> give, me the, give me the one thing to fix me. And I think sometimes yeah. we have to recognize that not everyone is in the place of making all of these across-the-board changes. However, they are in this pace of opening up to awareness. That's where we really, truly are these days. They're opening up to a different awareness of having a different perception about how they're existing in the world today. Because what happened was, I saw that woman 10 years later, she said, it took me 10 years to get through that list. Mm -hmm. But boy, Mm -hmm. it was awesome. Because it's about that journey of changing our perception and how we live, yes? Right. And, you know, we can't change everything at once. It it becomes overwhelming if we're going to change all our habits at once. But one of the things that we talk about in the book is making some, you know, small changes over time. Uh, And if we make small changes, we can make other small changes. Uh, For instance, like, you know, what we eat. Um, You know, we're in a fast food nation. Uh, the standard American diet or the SAD has, you know, failed us, um, and it's it's inflammatory. It's, you know, causing us to be unhealthy and overweight. And so, um, you know, we recommend just adding adding some vegetables to your diet. You don't have to eat, you know, uh, five vegetables a day at the beginning, but just add some vegetables to your diet. Um, you know, I, ha- I had one patient who, when I suggested that, you know, looked at me like I was kind of crazy. And I said, you know, yeah. if nothing else, just add some uh, chopped parsley, you know, to your steak or baked potatoes, right. you know. Um, make it, uh, you know, just make some small changes early on. Um, you know, eat some berries. Uh, try to eat food that's different colors. And all these things are uh, are good for us and uh, are, are anti-inflammatory to the to the bad inflammation that can happen in our body. And But yet there are things that we don't routinely think about because we're so used to um, the dietary habits that are all around us. And it's also, too, about what generation you have grown up in. Um, I grew up in the 50s, and it was about you go to the butcher and the baker and the farmer down the street, and that's Mm -hmm. how we lived. And that's what I remember. Yet there are other generations where I was sitting down to eat with someone, and they said, you know, they pretty much came up with a brown and white kind of dish. It was fried mm-hmm. and it was white or rice or potatoes or whatever it might be. And um, and never forget, they had asked for a hamburger and they said they didn't want all the stuff on it. I said, oh, you don't want the salad on your burger? And they said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, fine. I'll take all, uh, give him all of the stuff that it can come with and I'd take all of the stuff off of it and eat that and turn around and give them my meat because I don't eat the meat. But So it, it mm-hmm. kind of works that way. And yet they still weren't able to be able to even say this. If there was a scrap of lettuce, they were not going to eat it. However, mm-hmm. Dr. Patterson, we can also integrate different ways in which you can get fresh foods in. You can maybe use a tincture. You can maybe use a supplement. You can maybe Mm -hmm. juice it. You can maybe use some powders and sprinkle it on your food. There are many different ways to be able to get nutrition of those nutrients that you're saying there's no way I'm going to do it. There are many different ways. You can still find that you'll be able to, you know, get that delivery system. Right, and um, especially, you know, when when people are eating um, calorie-dense, nutrient-poor diet, uh, which is uh, common in our uh, standard American diet, Mm -hmm. it's important to look at, make sure you're getting, uh, you know, the vitamins and nutrients that you do need, and so you may need to take a multivitamin, you may may need to take supplements. And I think also, you know, over time is if you just think about, you know, some different things that you can eat. um, Right. You know, introduce some vegetables here and there. It doesn't have to be a drastic change, but yeah. uh, you know, have some have some walnuts, have some almonds. Use some herbs and spices. Use some turmeric and ginger when you're cooking. Um, use yeah. some uh, herbal teas. Uh, stay hydrated. Um, you know, dark chocolate, which is something that uh, most of us who like chocolate enjoy dark chocolate as well as milk chocolate. But dark chocolate has been shown to have 
um, very, very good benefits for heart health, and it's restorative, and it can even be calming because of the flavonoids and antioxidants that are in it. So there are a number of things, you know, that are that are good for us that we don't routinely think about, but if, if we just uh, think a little differently and introduce these things into our diet, even just a small amount can be helpful. Yeah, it's it's truly all about your habits, about what you're used to, and what you're willing to be open up to. You know, I can remember mm-hmm. when I was raising my kids, um, they would have, tr- I would call it trees. They would have a piece of broccoli on a dish before every meal, and they would eat mm-hmm. that. Then they got the rest of the meal. But they always had their <laughs> vegetables first on the dish before they got any of the rest of it because we knew it was going to happen and they weren't going to eat it, you know. So mm-hmm, I think mm-hmm. it's truly up to us to say, what am I willing to do? How can I finesse the journey to be able to have that experience and then take it on? Because sometimes they're like, it's oh, it's this, that, or the other, and it's sort of like that's your own roadblocks. So mm-hmm. are we willing? I think your book is Breath for the Soul. It's truly about saying, are we willing to see what our roadblocks are, face them on, and then say, I'm willing to let those roadblocks go. Cool. Yes. Well, in fact, one of the things that we emphasize is that all of these changes are about self-care. You know, they're empowering things that we can do ourselves. Uh, they, You know, it's not something that somebody else does to us. They're choices that we make to help ourselves, whether it's our breath work, whether it's movement, nutrition, or using our spirit. You know, all of these things. Uh, we can make choices to help ourselves. And so that's why it's all about self-care and empowering yourself, uh, you know, to help yourself in all these dimensions. Also, too, you share in your book about spirit connections. You know, sometimes people will say, oh, you're talking about religion. Others will say, oh, you're talking about God. Others will say, oh, I have a, I have a connection with you. I'm just sitting here connecting with you right now. We're having a spirit mm-hmm. connection because we're engaging mm-hmm. with each other. So there are many different types of spirit connections, but I think sometimes we put a label on it and then we get stuck in that dogma and judgment. How do you mm-hmm. extend those spirit connections to see everyone and everything in all dimensions of time? Well, as I talk about in the book, really spirituality uh, can come from your faith. It can come from service or nature or the arts. But it's just a sense of our interconnectedness with other human beings and some higher power, you know, in the universe. So it's not necessarily religion. Now, my, my co-author, Phyllis Nichols, is an inspirational Christian author, and her responses to what I talk about in terms of the evidence for breath, movement, nutrition, and spirit, she writes a, a spiritual response to that that's related to her faith. But You know, spirituality doesn't have to be uh, based in religion. Spirituality is really just a sense that we're recognizing that we're all connected to each other by a power greater than all of us. And that's really a quote from Brene Brown. Um, You know, and and, uh, we we can look for synchronicity in our lives, Uh, you know, things that happen that seem to be a coincidence, but uh, really may be some spirituality connections. So I think that, um, you know, we need to not limit our spirituality to uh, to religion, but it can be, um, again, through nature, through the arts, just recognizing a sense of connectedness to each other. Let's talk about the word calm, because many times people will say, oh, you want me to turn my volume down? Am I too noisy for you? You know, mm-hmm. or others will say, but I'm already calm. I'm depressed. You know, I'm just, I'm already in that slump. I'm already stuck to the cement, so to speak, you know. How much more calm do you want me to be? And <laughs> essence, when we use the word calm, sometimes some people feel like they are turning down their sense of self in expression. And it really um, can be taken so many different ways, don't you think? Yes, I think so. Um, we don't, when we say calm, in fact, we talk about, you know, uh, going from anxiety to calm. And so what we're talking about there is just being able to relax using breathing, breathing movement, nutrition, and spirit to relax, and in doing so, becoming more of ourselves. So it doesn't mean that we have to stop talking or stop doing things or stop being ourselves. It just means that we're able to act more rationally, 
treat people more kindly, actually think more clearly because uh, when we are calm and, our, and we're in our uh, relaxation, parasympathetic response, we're thinking more clearly and we can actually be more of ourselves. Yeah, because you really think of the paradigm from rock stars all the way down to monks. You know, a, a monk is very quiet and serene and peaceful and very mm-hmm. um, very limited engagement, you know, but they're very connected. You think of rock stars and they're kind of like all out there, like spewing it all out there, you know, but they mm-hmm. do have a sense mm-hmm. of who they are and know it because they leave the stage. So the essence is, is do we have to stay in one place or can we not dance along that paradigm? Sometimes people will say, but I really feel this one day and I might feel that. And then they're like, oh, gosh, here comes a label of bipolar. And it's like, stop. They're just they're just moving through these phases and enjoying and experiencing sometimes, you know. I think we get so afraid that there might be something wrong with this. If someone starts to speak up, starts to change their diet, sometimes um, may turn around and not want to engage with all the people that they were with before. Maybe they want to Mm -hmm. make a change, and they're just like, you know, I'm done with y'all. Y'all can go. So there are Mm -hmm. many different things that happen when you start taking on self-care, and you think, don't be worried about it. This is a paradigm line you can dance along, and you'll be okay. I think the most important thing people are asking us when they come to us is, am I going to be okay? And it doesn't matter whatever else comes out of their mouth. That's really what they're looking at for. Yes, and there's certainly going to be uh, times in our lives when uh, we're more active or when we're doing certain things, and then over time we change. Our preferences can change. Our friends can change. Um, And so we just need to uh, go with the flow on that and accept who we are at a given point in time. But in all of those times, just remember that we can take care of ourselves uh, and and doing things like, uh, you know, breath work, meditation. Meditation is really very important. Just taking Mm -hmm. some time at the beginning or the end of the day to be calm. Uh, You can use a guided meditation, which is what I often do. There are many uh, apps now that are available that have uh, easy access to guided meditations. So just some time to calm down to think clearly, uh, you know, to try, your clear, to try to clear your mind. And I hear a lot of people say, oh, I can't meditate. You know, I've tried that. You know, you don't have to totally clear your mind of all thoughts. You know, it's mm-hmm. like if, if you're just quiet and, you, and thoughts come to your mind, I mean, that's okay. You can just say, okay, and I'm going to go ahead and, you know, think about where I am right now. Um, So you don't have to, to, I think it's kind of a misperception that you have to totally clear your mind of all thoughts. Um, But, you know, even when these thoughts come to your mind when you're meditating, you're observing your thoughts, and that's not something that you're doing when you're not meditating. So just taking some time to observe, you know, to be calm uh, is very helpful, you know, doing that for 10 or 15 minutes just at the beginning of the day or the end of the day can be very helpful. Yeah, I think when the first uh, meditation started to be more popular, there were a lot of places around here in New Orleans where people were going in. It was like, uh, and she had a sign up on her store and it said guided meditation at 10 o'clock. And I was so excited and I was talking to her and everything. And then I walked out and I said, I'm not getting any guided. She's not taking me anywhere. I can do my own just fine, (laughs) you know, because I think sometimes people will say, but, you know, guided meditation is great to get you started. However, you really get to a space where you're on your own path. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think that the idea is that there doesn't have to be any certain way to do anything. There's not a certain way to breathe. There's not a certain way to live. It's not a certain thing that everybody has to eat. There's not a certain way to be presented in this world. But what we're giving you today are guidelines and tips, and we're sharing inspiration Mm -hmm. of some things that may help you to be able to start to feel better or to say, oh, Mm -hmm. well, today this is what I'll work with, and isn't that awesome? So it's helping you to be able to maybe just feel a little bit um, unplugged or disconnected, and that's great to help you step out of the noise. Or it may also to be able to help you engage with others to be able to get back into the flow of life. Don't you think those are tips that we really hope to help everyone with? 
Yes, exactly. And, you know, we talk about in the book, we give several different examples of, you know, breath work techniques. We give a lot of different examples about movement. You know, if you don't like moderate or vigorous activity, you know, uh, yoga is good. Movement meditations like yoga, tai chi, or qigong. Um, you know, so you can choose, you know, whatever uh, breath technique works for you. Choose whatever movement works for you. Um, choose whatever spirit connections or technique works for you. Um, and, you know, types of meditations, you know, as you said, you can use a guided meditation or you can do it on your own. So, um, and, and we, we talk about essential oils in the book too. And, you know, there are a lot of different preferences for essential oils. That's really something that's very personal. Some people like uh, some and others uh, like, you know, different ones. So that's another thing that we talk about that's a very personal choice. But, Yes, there's a lot of different choices of these uh, self-care things that you can do. I think the point of it is, you know, to, to be conscious about it, to be thinking about what can you do to care for yourself in, in these different realms. Um, and I, I think that's what's important in choosing what works for you. Let's talk about the idea of movement. People say, you want me to go out and start exercising? I'm not going to do it. I'll say, awesome. <laughs> I'm not one of those people either, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And, um, you know, but I look back on my life, and there was a period there where I loved to jog for many years. And there was another mm-hmm. period where I played racquetball. There was another where I just did dancing. There was another period where I just did walking. There was another period where I did nothing because I needed mm-hmm. to do nothing because my body had to recuperate from certain mm-hmm. situations. So I think the idea is what is conducive today to support you today? That's what your next step would be. So sometimes people will say, but I don't know where to get started. And I j- sometimes just say, just walk outside and sit down mm-hmm. at the nearest bench or the nearest piece of grass. Awesome, you right. just made it out the door, you know what I mean? Right. And then eventually people will be able to find their own way and their own path. I think sometimes, uh, you know, people at the beginning of the new year, they buy all their new equipment or their new programs, and mm-hmm. they have mm-hmm. all of these things they're going to do, and a few months in they're saying, oh, that just doesn't work for me. And I'll say, yes, it did. Mm-hmm. It got you to do something different for a few weeks. Mm-hmm. Isn't that great? Now pick something yeah. to go forward. Instead of believing we always have to do something and we're a failure, we're not. We did it for that period of time, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, and and I think, you know, uh, one of the reasons we call it movement instead of exercise is because, you know, the word exercise has such a negative connotation for people. And, you know, you don't really have to do what's perceived of as exercise, quote-unquote. It's the point of, you know, movement. Walking is an excellent way to move. You know, it it, uh, uses all the muscles in our body. It relaxes us. And, you know, we talk about forest bathing, which is uh, actually started in Japan. It's uh, actually an evidence-based way to calm yourself. And forest bathing, um, it's not a brisk walk, you know, through uh, the forest. It's actually going out and being very mindful of the sights and sounds of the textures, the smells. Um, and so it's not, you know, really exertional at all. You're using your mind. Yeah. Um, but it's found to be, you know, a, a very helpful thing, a very restorative thing. So, um, you know, there's there's a lot of different kinds of movement. And even moderate or big, vigorous movement that's recommended, it, you know, you don't have to do 30 minutes all at one time. You can do 10 minutes here and there throughout the day. And so that helps people, too, um, you know, knowing that. You don't have to go out and, you know, jog for 30 minutes. Um, You can uh, just take some intervals during the day where you're more active. You know, it's so funny about that word forest bathing. I can remember in the 50s and 60s, um, you know, we lived in a very rural area, and I used to lay down in the cemetery that was right next door to us, and I would always do that every single day as a little kid and and just converse with the spirits. And when I went into Mm -hmm. the forest, I always knew there was someone there, and I would turn around, and I would always distinctly knew every single thing in the woods because there were elementals there, you know, so I was very distinctly Mm -hmm. engaging with them. So I think the idea is that if we close our eyes and we say, have I been here before? What can I smell in my thoughts and in my mind? What have I felt a story about? And go out and engage that, 
that will mm-hmm. lead you on a path to be able to say, this is awesome, I've been here before, and it will it's almost like walking your hand like with the fairy through the forest, maybe taking mm-hmm. you out to the beach, maybe taking you outside to be able to just sit in the grass. Still others, it might take you to just lay upon a pool of water. It's about mm-hmm. the idea is close your eyes and find that one moment in time and be able to breathe that in. You keep using that memory to tune into peace, to calm, to sense of restorative health, Mm -hmm. and also, too, to really tune into your soul and your spirit. That's your source. You just forgot Mm -hmm. about it, right? Yes. Yes, and uh, smell in particular is very much um, a sense that evokes, you know, past memories. Um, You know, we smell chocolate chip cookies and we may think of our grandmother's kitchen. Um, You know, uh, the smells in the forest, the smell of the grass or the trees can remind us of, you know, hiking in the past or other other pleasant memories. So, um, and, and, you know, our sight and our uh, touch can also evoke memories from the past and pleasant memories. And in fact, one of the more effective things in guided meditations is just to close your eyes and to think of one of the most pleasant places you've ever been and to think of the sounds, the smells, the sights, you know, the texture of what's going on uh, in that place where you were that was so pleasant for you. And that is, you know, can be very calming, uh, you know, can can lower your heart rate, uh, can uh, make your breathing more regular and deep when you are thinking about something pleasant like that. Right. Let's talk about the word grief for a while. So many will say, what is that? Um, It's from a loss, and it could be any kind of a loss. I've even had someone say to me, but I, I haven't lost a person. I just lost this or that or something else. Mm-hmm. And it mm-hmm. still was a sense of it. And I mm-hmm. think I used the word to them. I said, that's a sense of that grief energy instead of mm-hmm. saying it's grief because it's grief is an identity. If it's a sense mm-hmm. of grief energy, you can feel it and move it through. Sometimes people will say, I'm stuck in it, this is me, I am grieving, I am it, and they own it, and it becomes very difficult to shed that cloak, because when they Mm -hmm. shed that cloak, what's on the other side, and they're not sure. That's definitely a step where people will say, well, if I come out of my grief, what's there, and it's going to be a new life to restart, and many people are not right. ready for a new life, and that's scary, mm-hmm. don't you think? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, and I remember uh, when I lost my younger son 10 years ago, I had never realized how much fear there is in grief, you know, mm-hmm. because I, I felt fear. You know, what am I going to do without my son? Um, so, yes, uh, definitely fear is a part of grief. And... Um, you know, uh, the acute grief and mourning, yes, we have to go through that at our own pace and in our own timing. And then I also think it helps to, to talk with others. You may need to talk with a grief counselor or a mental health professional, uh, particularly if, you know, it comes a time when it's time to go back to work um, and you're still not functional. So and there's things that, that we can do, you know, to help. Um, there's things that we can uh, do. We can ha- we can have memorials for our loved ones. Uh, meaningful work, being of service, is very helpful. Um, you know, to uh, getting back to ourselves. I think many times, you know, we're kind of afraid um, to to get back to a, a somewhat normal state because we feel like it it might be, you know. Um, Denying that person, you know, uh, meaning that it, it didn't mean we, it means that we can, you know, the fact that we can go on without that person is a denial of that person or something negative right. about that person. But in fact, you know, um, and if we think about it, you know, that person would want us to go ahead uh, with life and, uh, you know, to flourish and move ahead. And so, um, you know, it's a very gradual thing, um, and especially you know, like the loss of a child or the loss of a spouse can be very devastating. 
But as you said, you know, it doesn't have to be the loss of a person. It can be the loss of a job, uh, you know, or, or the loss of something else, not necessarily a person. But, um, you know, there's lots of things that we can do. Uh, we can use our uh, intentional breathing. I wish I had known more about intentional breathing 10 years ago uh, because I remember sometimes it was just even hard to catch my breath. Um, and, you know, using our slow, deep, regular breathing can help us get back uh, to that place where we can think more rationally uh, and, um, you know, act more calmly. Mm-hmm. I also think, too, Dr. Patterson, the idea is that when you're asking for help and you're looking for guidance and seeking inspiration and you're knowing that something is wrong and you're just seeking, and when you're on that seeking mm-hmm. path, I've always shared on this show for almost a decade, it's over a decade now, um, I said, you know, are you looking for someone to walk up and reach down and pick you up and carry you? Are you asking for someone to reach down, offer you something that will help you to get up? Or are you seeking for someone that walks up in the middle of the bridge and says, lay lay down next to you, and they say, tell me about your world. What do you see Mm -hmm. from here? Mm -hmm. Those are many different types of people to be able to help you. And the idea is to know that there are many different types of people out there and find the one that works for you. And when it stops working, find someone different to be open Mm -hmm. to that. Sometimes you need someone that will lay down next to you and say, tell me about your Mm -hmm. perspective from where you Mm -hmm. are, and I'm here. You know, I even saw something on uh, social media at one time. A girl was outside, you know, and she was outside having an anxiety attack, and her mother was driving up in the car. Someone had called her, and she got out of the car, and she laid down on the grass next to the daughter. And I said, that's it. Mm-hmm. That's exactly it. Mm-hmm. Because when you can lay down next to them, you can see it from their space and time and just be yeah. with them. So I think sometimes yeah. we're afraid to step out and say, are there people out there that can help me with the need that I need right now? And the answer is yes, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that I write about in the book, which was part of my grief experience, um, is that, the the people that I found most valuable uh, in Mm -hmm. uh, recuperating from the acute grief process were those who would just listen, you know, who didn't give me a lot of advice or platitudes, but just listened. Uh, And, you know, they they heard where I was. Um, You know, they were with me, uh, you know, if I was crying. They just listened. Um, And I found those people to be the very most helpful. And, and, you know, know, a grief like uh, losing a child or, a spouse or a close loved one, it's not something that you ever really totally get over. I think of it as a journey. And, you know, Kubler-Ross uh, said, you, you will be whole again, but you will never be the same. So, in fact, that type of grief, you know, it changes you, but mm-hmm. you can move ahead. You can be whole again. You know, I found that early on I needed to lean on others, lean on God, lean on others, and just do the next thing. It's what someone had told me, and I found that, that was very helpful advice. And then later on, as I just found people that would just listen, I found that to be extremely helpful. So, um, yes, I, I think that finding those people who will lie down beside you, who will just listen to you, right. that's one of the most valuable things in, in recovering from a grief. Also, too, I think that uh, grief can also be a grief of loss of perception of your health, of the state mm-hmm. your body is in um, mm-hmm. and when you approach end of life, that grief is monumental. You know, as I work mm-hmm. so much with uh, patients at end of life and they say, you know, I, I am just so depressed, I am just so sad, I am just in this state. And yet, you know, many of the professionals are out there, well, let's get you out of your depression. Let's do, you know, even my grandmother, they did electric shock therapy to her brain because she was depressed. She was 101. Are you kidding me? You know, Mm -hmm. Um, and I think the idea is is that um, we look at and we say, are these times we have to have someone beside us that can say, I hear, I feel, I sense, and I'm here. Mm-hmm. And that might be all they need because 
I think sometimes when you have a disease that takes away, maybe uh, you have a part of your body, you may be losing part of your soul, you may be feeling like it's going away, part of your memory may be starting to disappear, Mm -hmm. Um, part Mm -hmm. of your uh, ability to be able to eat or digest food, all of these different things, you know, are out there. The difference is that really brings its own grief. And if you look at it and everybody that has a disease these days, are they all carrying grief as their cloak or are they carrying it as I understand it and I'm going to do my best with this to keep going forward in life? Because Mm -hmm. it can really take you out. And I'm sure you've seen it. I know I've seen it all the time, too, over our many decades together of being in healthcare. Um, You know, over five decades and, and yours, too, it's like, wow, all of these people are truly in some form of grief. When they walk mm-hmm. in here and walk out, right? Yes. Well, you're right. And, you know, the loss of health or, you know, uh, discovering that you have a d- disease, that's another loss, uh, you know, because mm-hmm. you've changed and you have to deal with yourself differently. Um, and I think that, you know, but still using those principles, you know, of your breath, of your nutrition, of your spirit to deal with that is very important. And, of course, now we have the specialty of palliative care, which uh, so right. many people found, find very valuable because it's not denying, you know, what's happening happening to you, but it's working with you. It's uh, accepting where you are. It's you know helping to make you comfortable, you know, helping helping you to look to your spirituality and that sort of thing. So, so that's been a big advance in what we can do for people, um, you know, who are very ill these days. Yeah. You know, at end of life, it's, it's you know, for myself, I always say, are you seeing angels? And they're like, yes, or I want to. Mm-hmm. I'll say, fine, mm-hmm. let's go do that. You know, so I think the idea yeah. is sometimes there are so many parameters in our life. And what you and I shared today, everything from a fantastic quality of life to the end of life and beyond. And we say, how do we navigate in those ups and downs? And it's about mm-hmm. finding things that will keep you stable that will keep you rooted and grounded. That's mm-hmm. your breath. That's food to bring mm-hmm. in to nourish you and to keep yourself mm-hmm. moving still in this world. Those are the three pillars. Mm-hmm. And there's the three pillars that will hold you steadfast no matter how many things take you onto the wind or into the hurricane, don't you think? Yes, I agree. And also using your spirituality, you know, and still remembering the interconnectedness that we have and the sense of a higher being. Uh, a power greater than all of us. I, I think that's another helpful thing too that that people find at the end of life or when they're very ill. And again, having those friends who will just listen, who stand by us, who lay down beside us, who just listen. Uh, that's also very valuable. And that I think is using part of our spirituality when we reach out to others um, and others listen to us. Yeah, because truly, our soul and our spirit is the who we are, the I am, and that's eternal. This is just a human existence. You know, it's only a mm-hmm. chapter in a book. You know, we too will go on. So I think um, it's, it's been such a great time talking with you, Dr. Patterson, today. Can you share with the listener how, how to find out more information about your work? Uh, yes. Well, the book that we've written is Breath for the Soul. Uh, and uh, my website is drjanpatterson.com. Very good. Well, Dr. Patterson, it was a pleasure to have you with us here today to talk about these subjects because so many times people will say, I've gotten stuck with that and there must be only this treatment or that therapy. And what you and I shared today is that there are a multitude of experiences you can engage with that can help shift you and let go of those labels. Yes? Yes, I agree. And and that's one thing about the book. We wanted to talk about the whole spectrum of the soul you know, not just one aspect, but the whole and things that you can do for yourself. Thank you, Dr. Jeanette. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for joining us. If you'd like to find out more information about Dr. Jan Patterson, again, the book is Breath for the Soul, Self-Care Steps to Wellness. Please do click on the link on the bottom of today's show page for more information. And it truly is about being able to say there is so much more to you. There's so much more you can experience and you can engage in. Just be aware that there is a door. Everything has a door. Step out. Take a breath. Just stand still for a moment and take it in. What would you like to do? What would you like to see? What would you like to feel? And start on that journey. 
Thank you so much for joining us today. This is Dr. Jeanette Gallagher. Until tomorrow, have a great day. Today we discuss many life-changing concepts. Who do you turn to and how do you know what is best when faced with a health crisis? Dr. Jeanette is a patient advocate. She listens to the patient, the doctors, and the family, clarifies the health issues and concerns, then helps the patient make the best choices going forward. If you would like help implementing change into your life and health, we can talk and see where you are stuck and how to improve the quality of your life. Check the link on the bottom of today's show page or visit drjeanettegallagher.com to schedule a phone appointment today.